Every year, there are thousands of movies released, and I see like 40 of them. So I think who better to do a top 10 greatest movies of 2021 than I? Yeah, this is not going to be the be all end all for movies. Don't stick around if you're looking for some deep insight into a movie that passed you by. These are very mainstream affairs. They went to theaters for the most part. Nothing groundbreaking. And even some of the big mainstream movies I missed, like House of Gucci, Spencer, and of course, what I assume is a cinematic masterpiece, Boss Baby 2. With those caveats out of the way, let's begin at the number 10 spot. Yeah, that's right. I have two movies in the 10 spot. Your eyes aren't deceiving you. Shang-Chi and Black Widow. They both, they're both here. MCU movies, no, no Eternals, sorry, that one. That one didn't make the list. Here's the deal. This wasn't a great year for cinema in my mind. A lot of movies really disappointed me, especially in the streaming service category. So the fact that these are even on here is like a blessing for them. They're fine. They're, they're both fine movies I enjoyed. They have plenty of action, interesting characters. We were introduced to Yulana and of course Shang-Chi himself. And Aquafina wasn't even annoying to me for once. I really loved the crouching tiger slash Jackie Chan-esque fights that Shang-Chi provided. That bus fight, I mean, come on, that's one of my favorite of the MCU so far. And although Black Widow rubbed a lot of comic book fans the wrong way by what they did to Taskmaster, I mean, I had no qualms, I had no understanding of the comics going in, so it didn't bother me. I can totally sympathize though, I've been there. I've seen how movies have ruined characters from different properties. So if you hate Black Widow because of it, that's fair game. It also came out about 15 movies too late in the MCU, but I still think it did its job. I did look at Scarlett Johansson's Black Widow as more than just a nice asset. If you catch my drift. Now there was actual some character there. I get why she was crying into a sandwich during Endgame. Par for the course for the MCU? Sure, absolutely. But par for the course in 2021 is sadly a good thing. If Edgar Wright comes out with a movie, I'm in the theaters for it. Last Night in Soho had the potential to be my favorite of the year, but it's bumped all the way down to nine because of the ending, which I just couldn't get on board with. It goes a little too Looney Tunes for me in the final act, a little too Mickey Mouse. Edgar Wright's a director that takes chances though, and I respect the hell out of that. This isn't your par for the course, like the last two movies I talked about. It's got some interesting ideas at play. The cinematography is on a different level. I love the way they're playing off the mirrors, reflecting the two lead women. There's deeper commentary than just what you see on the surface. I loved the horror aspects of the film. I just wish the whole thing would have tied up a little bit nicer. Edgar Wright's not only known for his beautiful cinematography, but his phenomenal soundtracks featuring some really awesome tunes. This one's no exception. So if you slept on last night in Soho, I suggest waking up and giving it a shot. The Daniel Craig James Bond movies have been pretty flaky for me over the years. They go back and forth between greatness and, and kind of patheticness. Here, thankfully, we're on the good end of things. I think No Time to Die does a really good balancing act when it comes to the James Bond property. It takes some of those sillier aspects, like the cars shooting missiles out, and marries them really well with the darker, more gritty tone that these Daniel Craig movies have going. It's also the deepest we've dug into the character of 007. Usually everything's very top level. He likes his martini shake and not stirred. He bangs chicks. He goes out and kills bad guys. Wash, rinse, repeat. Sometimes not even a wash in between. It's gross. You guys got to have a lot of diseases. Although M probably has a pill he can take for just about everything. This is another one of those movies that probably will turn some people off due to its controversial ending. I myself enjoyed where they took the character and I'm glad they weren't afraid to just go for it. We do unfortunately have an underbaked villain here with motivations that seem suspect at best by the time the film wraps. But there is an awesome amount of action, some great newcomers to the lineup, and Daniel Craig hasn't shown his age here. He's still kicking ass. He probably could have done another three or four Bond movies if he wanted. Dune is a weird ass movie and I just eat it up. Nom 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 nom. It's long as shit, it doesn't conclude. It's got some vague dialogue that hopefully will lead to something in part two. 
and I just everything about it's bonkers and shouldn't work. Yet, I think the director fully pulls it off. And that's because of gorgeous cinematography, some really seamless CG, top tier acting, especially from Zendaya. Oh my God, Zendaya is so good in this. Okay, I'm being sarcastic. Why were people going off about her? Is it just like a requirement that you have to gush over everything that actress does? She's in this film for like eight minutes and has four lines of dialogue. Let's move on. Let's move past Zendaya. Oddly enough, Jason Momoa, the worst actor of the bunch here, I thought was the best. He, he was the more relatable guy. He's going off to try to find out what's happening with the Spice Mines. He was the blue collar down to earth guy that I could relate to. The film takes the pages of the book, brings them to life. I like the idea of the chosen one being almost cliche on purpose. There's this whole secret organization of witch-like people. I can't remember what they're called. Uh, but but they know that this is like a red herring of sorts that he's not actually the savior it everything about it It's got it's got some really good layer to it a film I absolutely need to watch again and I will when that second movie gets out which is in like four years Oh my god, they're gonna take forever on this What's even more amazing is this is a Warner Brothers movie who has been missing so much more than they've been hitting lately uh, You got one right here for me The Mitchells vs. The Machines was another movie that came out of nowhere. Landed on Netflix. I think it was produced by Sony. You have two companies that consistently disappoint me. Coming together and presenting something that's just fun, engaging, humorous, full of heart. I really dug this movie. It reminded me of like The Incredibles if none of the characters had anything remarkable about them. The movie has the played out robots taking over the earth apocalyptic plot going on. It gives off vibes from a lot of movies. Wally -E springs to mind as well, but the movie knows it does. It, it embraces it, it has fun with it. There's giant Furby attacks. There's robots that try to act human but come off in incredibly creepy. There's the out of touch father who wants to connect with his daughter but can't on any meaningful level. The movie's just chock full of imagination, life. I, I can't say enough good things about it. The only animated movie I thought was better was... Luca. Did anyone see this movie outside of my family? I really hope so. It's a treasure, folks. You should watch Luca if you haven't. They kind of sent this one out to die on Disney+. Plus. It didn't get a theatrical release, really didn't get a marketing push at all. Beautiful to look at. The animation is top notch. We follow a young sea monster who realizes he can step foot on land and turn into a human unless he's wet. Luca is the sea monster I'm referring to. It's his relationship with Alberto that just really makes this movie stand out. They go on a quaint adventure together to win a Vespa, the staple vehicle of Italy. Even though the premise is very simple and childlike for kids to easily enjoy, parents can also see past the facade to a deeper, sadder undertone. Alberto's struggling internally with who he is and where he belongs, while Luca's more naive to the world around him. As the movie progresses, these two will form a relationship that's just very special. And when the final credits roll, if you're not holding back some man tears, you're heartless inside. And you probably didn't even make it this far into the film. If you're looking for an animated movie for the whole family that's not Trolls World Tour or Boss Baby 2, that maybe has a bit more richness to it, please check out Luca. It deserves your time. From a lot of the same team that brought you John Wick comes Nobody. Another John Wick movie. And that's a great thing. While it's not exactly one to one with John Wick, there are a ton of similarities between the two. Yet it has just enough differences to separate it from the other property. That doesn't mean I don't want to see a team up film, because God, would that be awesome. Or at least a cameo. Just a cameo would be nice. Bob Odenkirk kicks all sorts of ass in this as nobody. A family man who's rebranded himself after getting out of the seedy underbelly he was once a part of. No, there's no dead dog in this one to get Bob Odenkirk off his leash. 
A couple of inept crooks break into his house and steal something that belonged to his daughter. This puts him in a precarious situation as he befalls into a bunch of bad circumstances, one of which involves him kicking the living hell out of a bunch of dudes on a bus. Unfortunately for Mr. Nobody, one of those guys happens to be the son of a notorious mob boss, and that's when shit goes south real fast. Yeah, it's the basic plot of John Wick. <laughs> We've had a lot of these copycats over the years. Jolt, Kate, Atomic Blonde, and now Nobody. This one does it the best though, although Atomic Blonde was pretty awesome as well. If you're looking for an easy breezy bro fest that takes a couple hours, kicks a bunch of ass, check out Nobody. Full disclosure, this right here is a reshoot. I completely forgot that A Quiet Place Part 2 came out in 2021. This has been a wild last couple years, and by wild I mean incredibly boring in a lot of ways. It seemed like a lot happened in 2021, yet nothing at the same time. It's, it's very bizarre. Anyway, I really liked A Quiet Place Part 2 just as much as the first. It is missing John Krasinski. He only gets about 10 minutes of screen time, which is a shame, but those 10 minutes, <laughs> it's good stuff. It reminded me of Tom Cruise's War of the Worlds where he's running away from the threat, the alien behind him, shit's getting taken out, chaos, ensues. I'm all in. The film picks up right after the events of the last movie. Emily Blunt, once again a powerhouse here, doesn't have to say a lot. It's all happening through her actions. Killian Murphy joins the crew, I believe is how you pronounce his name. I've said it wrong so many times and people have corrected me that I don't even know what's right and what's wrong anymore. Um, but we're going with Killian. He's a, he was a great addition to the family. If you're a fan of The Last of Us, it's hard not to see the parallels between the movie and the game. And I know they're doing a TV show on HBO Max, but we, we already kind of had it right here. We also had it with Logan. The father-daughter type dynamic works so well in these types of situations. There's nothing to cling on to except for each other. They ratcheted up the action, they ratcheted up the horror and suspense. I'd say the only place where the movie suffers a little bit is the ending. It feels very abrupt, a little jarring, and doesn't quite have the conclusion I was hoping for. Clearly Krasinski wants a part three, and I'm there. I'm all for it. Spider-Man No Way Home makes the number two spot on my list, which means The Matrix 4 must be number one, right? <laughs> no! Look for that in my next video, Top 10 Worst Movies of the Year. Even though I and many others have a problem with the entire plot of the movie revolving around Doctor Strange helping Peter Parker erase the memories of everyone who knows he exists, <laughs> everything around that plot is really well executed. So let's talk about why this is the number two spot on my list. Well, fan service, baby. If it's done right, it's done right. I should say Spider-Man No Way Home hasn't been out that long. It's been a couple weeks. There's still people that haven't seen it, so there's gonna be some spoilers here. Just, just, just a forewarning. Toby's back. Andrew's back. I think they're done some great justice. Their characters still feel the same that they did all those years back in their properties. They get some really great time to shine. I would have liked more, but I'm selfish. I would like a whole movie revolving around these three. Preferably not entirely set at night. God, even when I'm praising this, I'm being a dick. I just, I just, I'm selfish, okay? I really liked what they had going here with these characters and their dynamic, and I would love to see more of it. Probably won't, which is unfortunate, but the fact that we even got some of it, I guess I should be grateful for. It's more than we got with those new Star Wars movies. Never got to see Han, Luke, and Leia together in a scene. So yeah, this is a win. Plus we get those iconic villains back. Dr. Octopus hasn't missed a step. The Green Goblin, Willem Dafoe, so good here. Just carries all the scenes he's in. I thought for sure Dr. Octavius would be the show stealer. No, Dafoe, man, Dafoe. Some people didn't like the Aunt May stuff, thought it was cringy, didn't work. I loved it. I, I was legitimately sad when she died. I. I thought they handled it perfectly. People did have no problem correcting me when I brought up how she says the with great power comes great responsibility line. I, I said she said it a little weird. She added a couple words to it and I guess it's more comic book accurate. Well, to you I say no. To you I say nigh. We're not only referencing the previous two Spider-Man universes, but we brought these people and their villains in. So now's not the time to quote the comic book. You should have quoted the line how it was given off to really resonate and hit home with the movie audience. 
I don't know why they decided to flex now on getting the comic book line correct, but it was, I still disagree. I think it was a bad move. So I'm a sucker for the drama and the movie delivered. It had a couple of cop out moments where we thought people were gonna die and they didn't, that's fine. It, it elicited some response from me and that's what a movie should do. These Spider-Man Homecoming movies are lighter than the other Spider-Man movies. I've accepted that. They are a little more childish. That's why the plot isn't very serious. It's, it's kind of like, and yeah, we can erase the mines, no big deal. Oh, we probably could have used this ability to erase Thanos' mind. Uh, you know, he could have forgot about the Infinity Stones, but whatever, this is new. You, you have to like set that stuff aside because even though all these Marvel movies are connected in some fashion, they're also separate. They're also, they also have their own tones. And Spider-Man is clearly a sillier family adventure. It can still have drama. It can still have some stakes. They're just kind of cushioned, they're protected. There's some airbags on this thing. The action is the best Homecoming has delivered so far. The jokes landed, I'd say 90% of the time. It was great seeing some of those high schoolers back from the other two films. They're still very much keeping the tone the same. And that's a hard thing to juggle. It's a hard balance to keep, but uh, these movies have done a good job of it. So wow, we got three Marvel MCU movies on this top 10 list. Talk about a Marvel fanboy, right? What's he gonna put at his number one spot? Let me guess, something else by Disney or Marvel. No, Zack Snyder's Justice League isn't on here, but I do have the Suicide Squad, which is far better than that thing. And it was far and away my favorite movie of the year. I had a blast watching this from beginning to end. They nailed these characters. Margot Robbie, who was a treasure in the original Suicide Squad, finally gets to be in a movie with a decent script. And she's surrounded by great actors and characters. I just mentioned how Spider-Man Far From Home has the best action in the Homecoming series. It's terrible compared to what we have in the Suicide Squad. The R rating really looks good on this Suicide Squad too. Far better than that PG-13 crap did. We got King Shark eating dudes alive? We have Harley Quinn impaling people with a spear? We have hilarious character moments from actors like Nathan Fillion, who should have been Nathan Drake, detaching his arms and just like hitting guys over the head. <laughs> so good, it's so stupid. James Gunn just gets me. He knows what I like and he's delivering it every time it seems. The Bloodsport Peacemaker Rick Flagg trio was just perfection. I loved these guys bouncing dialogue off each other beating the shit out of each other with some great music in the background. Then there's the giant alien star you Pokemon that our team has to fight in the last act. The movie is pure insanity with a giant ensemble of characters that somehow James Gunn helps me relate to. He makes them all likable, lovable in their sick, twisted way. There's a girl that hangs out with rats, yet I, I found her to be just charming beyond all compare. The director's brother, Sean Gunn, plays a character named Weasel that I somehow felt bad for when he drowned. <laughs> I mean, it, what are you doing, James Gunn? How are you getting this all so correctly? I've seen this film already three or four times and I have a blast every time I watch it. Really looking forward to the Peacemaker spin-off show on HBO Max, and man, I can't wait for a sequel to this film. Well, there you have it, my 2021 best of movies list. I, again, haven't seen everything that came out. I missed a lot. I, I did my best, I, I really did. But now it's your turn. Tell me why my list is absolute trash and why yours is the greatness. Leave it below, give me your top 10, like the video if you had a good time, subscribe if you haven't already, and I hope to see you around. That's right, my next video is gonna be the top 10 worst movies of 2021. This uh, recording session went long already, so I'm gonna need a day or so to recuperate for the shit storm that's gonna pile upon these 10 movies I talk about. It's gonna be ugly, it's gonna be messy. Again, I encourage you, I implore you to subscribe, share the video around with your friends, maybe even become a Patreon or YouTube join member. Those are opportunities for you as well. And uh, with that, I bid you adieu. Adieu.